joining tonight. Um, so we're, we're pretty happy with the Blockchain Club to welcome Sandra and Laurent again here at AI. Uh, today it's great because today we're going to speak about a um, subject in blockchain that is a little bit more technical. Uh, so not the technical technical as in the technology, but another aspect that is also very technical, which is uh, how do blockchain uh, designers design incentives on those new uh, economic and social networks. And uh, yeah, last time Laurent and Sandra presented the roots of the movement. We had a little uh, meetup about crypto anarchism and cypherpunk. So that gave a little bit of uh, philosophical background about everything. Uh, here at IE, we're a business school, so most of the guys we're bringing here are from big uh, corporation. We had Santander, etc. So for now, it's a nice and interesting change to understand more about the mechanism behind uh, the technology. Uh, Laurent, you want to present? Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Theo, for bringing us here today. Real pleasure to present this uh, for the second or third time already. So hopefully it's, it's going to be better than, than before. <clears throat> we actually keep improving it every time. A uh, quick word about, about us and what we are doing here. So we started with blockchain space, Sunrise and I, uh, pretty much uh, two years and a half ago now, where uh, if you can imagine, the only ICO you could talk about was uh, Ethereum. So a lot has going on and uh, happened in the space since then. But we, uh, we start doing events and uh, learning about the technology itself and the space. And um, through that experience, uh, we're not coders or programmers. Uh, Sana is an economist and I'm a, an engineer by, by training. So we are autodidact, right? We learn by yourself, but we are fascinating by this, by this technology. And slowly but, but surely, we came to the understanding that the, the real important stuff was the stuff that nobody was talking about in the sense that, um, yeah, ICOs are uh, fancy and interesting, and, uh, but it, it's not really, you know, what, what is gonna, make evolve the space in the future. At least that's what we think. And so uh, quickly we, we figured out that below everything uh, in, in the blockchain is crypto economics. And crypto economics, as we hope to uh, provide you with uh, tonight, with this introduction, is basically the, the way to incentivize people to, uh, to take a decision, right, towards an, an outcome that is desirable for your project or your community. And we think it's important because it's a comeback for us uh, also to the, the fundamentals, the basics of why this stuff is important. We don't see this as just a, a, new, you know, a, a new wave of innovation. Before that it was big data and before that it was the, the web too. Uh, this is for us something that has the potential to change the, the lives of uh, so many people on this planet to finally get rid of things that are, in our opinion, useless in, on this planet. And to accomplish this, you need to really understand what is it about and how to make progress with the technology that we are. We were given almost a decade ago now by uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, and we have the potential to make it grow and evolve in, into so many more directions, uh, a lot more useful than what we maybe see today. So um, what we do, well, we are a crypto economics hub. So this is meant to be international. Everybody is welcome to join our efforts in understanding fundamentally. So this is really about the community, about learning, about sharing um, theories, experiences, and so on. So we've got a bunch of uh, Telegram group, uh, the main one, and also a specific one for uh, weekly sessions that we do on Sundays. Uh, that are, those are online sessions. And on Tuesdays here in Madrid, uh, physically, we, met, we meet in the international labs. 
where we uh, keep doing those, uh, those learning sessions. And apart from that, we have a uh, growing knowledge repository, if you like, that is going to be both on GitHub, but for now uh, on Discord. Uh, the links will be shared uh, on screen after, the, after the, the event. And I think that's uh, pretty much it, right? Yeah. So I leave uh, you with uh, Sandra for the first part of, of this talk. Thank you very much. OK, also from my side, welcome, everybody. So uh, before I start, I would like to know who here knows the concept of blockchain. Wow, really nice. And uh, who has heard about crypto economics? Mm -hmm. And who knows what is crypto economics? Oh, nice, really <laughs> come here and give the talk there. Okay, that's really good. That's amazing how this improves year by year by year. I mean, okay, so I will talk now about the elements of crypto economics because uh, most of the people mix this actually up and they think crypto economics is crypto economy. So they think uh, it's about how Bitcoin and all these cryptocurrencies influence on our current economy. But unfortunately, it's not this. It's far more complex. It's actually what um, Theo already said and Laura as well. It's actually the design behind. So Bitcoin was the first crypto economic model, if we want so. But now, I mean, I, I assume you're also familiar with Ethereum, you know that there's EOS, there's every day actually coming new, something new. And all these new applications, especially these token models, they, knew, they need new, also new mechanisms behind to make them actually work. So crypto economics is somehow the whole basement for all these applications, all these platforms to work. And what is so complex about this is one single word, and this word is decentralization. So at the moment, we live in an economy which is centralized, and this means that every company has people that take decisions. And they can make these decisions every day again. They can change uh, decisions they have done in the past. They can just, let's say, they can lead their companies, their products, their projects, uh, flexible to what is, what is demanded in the world at the moment. The problem with decentralization is we don't have this uh, central entity. And um, on the one hand, this is really good. I mean, this is what we, are, we, what we want to achieve because what is the problem of central entities? They can be manipulated, they can fail, all these problems. But on the other hand, if we don't have these central entities, we have to create mechanisms that will run on its own. Bitcoin is the first example that just run on its own. So what all these applications have, all these decentralized applications have, is they have creators. They don't have leaders, but they have creators. So Satoshi Nakamoto is the creator of Bitcoin. And he wrote down a set of rules the so-called protocol, uh, protocol. And in this protocol, all the mechanism is defined. And what is so complex about Bitcoin is that he had, or she, or a group, <laughs> it's most likely a group of people, no person on earth can be that intelligent. Um, so what he had, or she, or the group actually, um, I'm, yeah, we live in a really messed up world. No, but, um, uh, what, what the group of people had to do is imagine everything beforehand. So design all the mechanism before, without making any, any experiment. So I assume you are now in this, uh, in this economy where we do, just, um, we do just tests all the time. We have new ideas. Yeah, let's, let's make a test. Let's, make a, let, let's ask the customers what do they think. In this world, this doesn't exist. We can't make tests. Anyone knows why we can't make tests? People lose money. No, that's not a problem. In the current world, people lose money, woof, and they make tests again we'll and again. Sure, you can't launch it without testing. You got to be sure, sure, sure of everything. Yeah, because the problem is you have, you have a uh, dilemma. In the moment you launch, like for example, Bitcoin is launched, let's say. It's there. And we know Bitcoin has problems, huge problems. But we also know how difficult it is to change. Because if we want to change something in decentralized applications, we have to reach consensus. And if we don't reach consensus, we will have forks. And when we have forks, the community is split. 
So this is the problem of change that will happen afterwards. But on the other hand, we have another problem. The problem is if we design everything before actually testing it, we don't know the network effect. We don't know, because this is a really dynamic world, which has a lot of, I mean, we now speak a lot about the energy waste of Bitcoin. This was impossible to predict 10 years ago. So there is a lot of dynamics we can't predict without actually launching, launching the network. And this is a little bit the dilemma in which we are. And what we try with crypto economics is combining learnings from all dis, uh, the different disciplines, which I will present right now, um, to, to make a little bit more um, basement, a little bit more foundation on the applications we are designing. So let's start, because otherwise I will speak until tomorrow. So uh, the first element is cryptography. Cryptography, why is cryptography so important? Anyone here knows what is the role of cryptography in Bitcoin? Why do we use cryptography everywhere now in the blockchain space? To ensure that the blockchain is actually immutable? Mm, in which way? And everything on the blockchain is encrypted so that... Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, actually a little bit of a side effect. Because everything is decentralized, everything is, tra is transparent, and because everything is transparent, it has to be encrypted. Otherwise, everyone will know my, my account no? and my, my balance, and I don't want this. But this is not the role of cryptography. The actual role in this crypto, economics, uh, crypto economic model is that cryptography gives us the possibility to show evidence for certain things that happen. So in the centralized world, everything is really easy. If I have to prove my identity, I can just show you my passport. Or if I'm in the digital world, I can just verify through emails, through my uh, telephone number. I just need a unique identifier to show you my identity. But now we have a decentralized world. So there is no central authority that can prove I'm Sandra. And therefore, we use cryptography. And how we do this, for example, in Bitcoin is, uh, if you're familiar with digital signatures, this is a way to prove that I'm the owner of the private key. But I can also use digital signatures to prove whatever. The, the mechanism, I mean, are you familiar with digital signatures? Should I explain it shortly? Yeah, okay, really quick, because I, I didn't have so much to talk. Okay, so the idea in digital signatures is just one example how cryptography works. You have this pair of private and, and public keys. Yeah, these are just two numbers and they are connected through a mathematical connection. And now I want to prove to you that I have this private key. But obviously I don't want to show you my private key because if I show you my private key, you have access to my account. So what can I do? I can now you write a message, I'm Sandra, and I encrypt this message with my private key. Now I send you this message, not encrypted, encrypted, and my public key. And with my public key, you can decrypt this message and see that both are the same. And because only with the public key that is corresponding to the private key, this crypt, uh, encryption and decryption is working, you now have the evidence that I own the private key without have ever seen my private key. Okay, that's the magic of, of cryptography. And this cryptography we use, I mean, if you're in the blockchain space, hashing is just the word you hear all the time. Yeah? So hashing is another way of giving evidence for correctness. So in proof of work, for example, we use hashing to prove that someone has worked. Because if you are familiar with Bitcoin, you know that you have to fulfill a certain difficulty. You can't just show any hash. You have to show a hash which, ha which has a certain amount of numbers, be uh, zeros before. And with this, you prove, by using cryptography, you prove that you have done your work. Also in Merkle trees, we use hashes to prove that a message is included. Okay, so all this is actually a way to show that something has happened. We can even use hash locked transaction, which are locked for a certain time. And the hash is just opening after, for example, 20 hours. So with this mechanism, we can show that the time has passed. So what I want you to imagine is that cryptography is like a science 
we can use to give evidence for, for certain things we need. Because in the decentralized world, we can't ask anymore the, the, the service providers to do this for us. Okay, so we need to use the science to do this. It's actually also, if you think about it, it's actually also moving trust from states, from Google, from companies towards cryptography. Okay, so you don't need to trust a central entity anymore. You only need to trust that um, the mechanism, the mathematics behind is working. Yeah. Okay, I won't go into this. Um, if you are interested in seeing more of how cryptography is used in cryptoeconomic models, then I recommend you to look at the Raiden network, which uh, actually ap uh, applies the system to uh, state channels. Okay, the second discipline is game theory. Who here knows what is game theory? Okay, someone would like to give a try? What is game theory? Okay, game theory, it's the famous uh, definition by the professor... Nash. Nash. John Nash. John Nash. So it's basically a, a model where you, everyone's uh, opinion or everyone's action, the consensus of our actions will define what each other does. So if there's consensus, there's one outcome. If there's no consensus... Be careful with consensus. I think what you mean is equilibrium. So consensus is more the blockchain world. <laughs> equilibrium is more the game theory world. What you actually explained was the Nash equilibrium. So, but game theory, I mean, you go in this, is actually the study of strategic decision making in an experimental manner. What this means is if you ever come across some game theory um, um, situations, uh, scenarios, you know that it's always you, the players, they can always decide between cooperating or not cooperating. But what makes them cooperate or not are the incentives. Okay, so what we do in game theory is we study how people will make their decisions based on different uh, incentive uh, scenarios. And what we want to find out is where's the Nash equilibrium? Because the Nash equilibrium is a is a moment in which none of the players has an incentive to change his decision. Okay, so they both are stuck in, in this situation. The most famous one, I mean you talked about him already, is the prisoner's dilemma. Who knows here what is the prisoner's dilemma? Someone would like to explain it, sir? It's a dilemma, right? So there is something which uh, we can't go out. Uh, so what is the problem here? The problem is, I mean, the situation also, it's an example. Huh? It's like two people um, from a, I don't know, criminal group or something, they got caught by the police, and now they are both asked who did the, the act, yeah, the criminal act. And they have now two options uh, to, to answer to this question. One is to say nothing, yeah? and this is somehow cooperating, so I don't say that the other has done it, I cooperate. Or I could say, no, the other has done it, and this is somehow not cooperating. Okay? The problem is, if we look at uh, these kind of incentives, if both won't say nothing, both go free. Okay, because no one, the police can't do anything. If no one is saying anything, no, uh, the police doesn't know who, who did the, the act. But if, so the police is also not stupid, no? Well, sometimes at least. <laughs> so um, what they do is they put some incentives. And they say, um, if you say me that the other has done it, you get actually less you get an incentive more. Yeah? So they give the person an incentive to say wha what the other has done. So what I have now is this situation. This is uh, the, same, uh, the same situation just put in an incentive matrix. So if I now um, do not cooperate yeah? and I say that the other one has done it, but the other one is cooperating, so the other one is not saying anything, I gain even more. And this leads to this problem. So if you are if you're looking from this side, yeah, you are one person in this game. 
you can see that in any case, when you're not cooperating, you will always gain more. So if I'm not cooperating and you are cooperating, I gain two. If I would have cooperate, I only gain one. If I'm not cooperating and you are also not cooperating, I gain nothing. But if I would have cooperated and you not, I would have lost one. So this, from an individual perspective, the best thing is to not cooperate. And both have the same perspective. And because both have the same perspective, they end up in the zero, zero. So they both will not cooperate. They both will say the other has done it. And this is exactly the prisoner's dilemma because from a macro perspective, we, we all can see that the best situation would be cooperating. So the best would if they both ha wouldn't have said nothing. And this is actually our world today, if you look at this. How often are you in a situation where your incentive is actually to compete against the others? Because if they fail, you will gain. But if you would both work together, you might would gain even more. But if you cooperate and the other not, he will gain more. Okay, so we are so often in exactly in this situation in our, in our current world. But there are a lot of different uh, games, so this is one. And it's all always depending on the incentives. So this is, for example, a coordinated choice model. What does this mean? This means that the incentives are put in a way that the most important thing is to coordinate. So imagine you uh, want to have a date with your partner, and the most important thing for you is to do something together. Okay? It doesn't matter so much what you're doing, but you want to do it together. Obviously, you have some, uh, let's say you, are, you like more cooking or you like more boxing. So therefore, if you actually, in the end, do what you, are li what you like, you gain even more. But what we see is the worst situation, and that's why the incentive zero, zero is put when they can't find a combination, okay? So this is a, a, a game where it's all the incentives are put to coordinate in, uh, in, the, in the scenario. And I mean, um, this is a really nice web page. If you want to go into game theory more, I really recommend you to, to play this game here. It's, the, it's actually explaining uh, through game theory how our society lost trust in each other. So uh, it's really an interesting page. And what do you think are the main factors uh, for if a person will cooperate or not? There are actually three factors in game theory that influence if someone is cooperating or not. What do you think are these factors? Long term game. How often you play the game, yeah. Then something quite obvious, which I just shown. It's how much you receive. The incentive. But there's also one more, which so many people. In game theory, you don't know. Or let's say in game theory, what is normally the assumption is that everyone will act rational. So you assume that the other person will also act rational. And there's absence of communication. Is it the difference between you and the other people? No. It's something most of the people don't think about. It's actually explained in this side. Trust. Hmm? Yeah, and what is trust based on? Whether you do get access to information or not. Yeah, somehow. experience. Yeah, so it is actually the arrow. Do you know, I mean, you all know this situation where you actually wanted to cooperate, but because of an arrow, the other person doesn't perceive it. So the other per person, for example, perceive you cheated. Let's say we all know the messages, no? So often, someone is not responding. Uh, and we think this is a mean act. Why is he not responding? Why is she not responding? But maybe because just there's no time. So there was no not cooperation act. But we interpret it that way. And what uh, they found out by simulation is when the arrow is higher than 5%, so in 100 cases, 5%ed, five times you wanted to cooperate, but the other person is perceiving you, you are not cooperating. The best strategy to survive is cheating all the time. And without this five arrow, it's actually cooperating. 
So thinking this number through, look at our society and uh, how often we have arrows and what is the most common strategy in our current society. So if you want to go more into this, you can play the game here. It's, it's really, really interesting. But this is, I mean, now you're asking, okay, where's the connection to blockchain and so on? The connection isn't that far away because game theory is like a field which is, um, let's, let's say, in an experimental way, uh, trying to find out how people behave, how people take decisions in incentive situations. And if you, what is so special about Bitcoin? What, is, what do you think is so special about Bitcoin? What fascinates you about Bitcoin or blockchain? What is new? What has never been before? A unique digital asset. In which way? What the do way you mean? That, uh, it is through cryptography, you know that that is the only one that exists that is unique. Okay. But we had cryptography for a long time, and other applications were using it. The system forces the, the, the people to cooperate. It doesn't give any incentive to not cooperate. What do you mean with cooperate and not cooperate? If you want to cheat, you don't receive anything. Uh -huh. That's already really interesting, and that's actually true. So in Bitcoin, for example, the miners, they compete each against each other to find the hash, right? And what happens if they, for example, try to cheat? They don't play by the rules. The first transaction isn't 12.5 bitcoins to themselves, it's 20 bitcoins, so it's an error. What is he thinking? He is thinking, if I cheat and I show my hash and my block to everyone, everyone will not accept my block. So the incentives are put in a way that people behave correctly or that people actually compete against each other. Because if you think about bitcoin and uh, proof of work, this is actually a mechanism design. And what is the goal of proof of work? Or what is the goal in general? The goal is to find just one person who will update the blockchain, yeah, which is such a stupid job. And you need to find someone. And of course, you could just pay everyone, but this is really expensive. And therefore, they make this stupid game of finding a hash, which has no meaning at all. There's nothing behind. Yeah? Everyone is talking about all oh, this complex mathematical, yeah, 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 but it's only to find one person. That's the only goal. And you do this through incentives. So you know, if I win the race, I will gain bitcoins and I will gain the transaction fees. Okay? So what I already explained is we use game theory to understand humans and then we put this into mechanism design. So mechanism design is like inverse game theory. What it does is it has a clear goal, as I said, in, in Bitcoin, for example, find the single person who will update the blockchain. And it knows how people, how people react. It knows which incentives I have to put. But what is, um, what is unclear is the middle part. So the whole protocol, so the whole rules. If you have like a mathematical function, you know the end and you know the input, but you don't know the, the middle part. And this is also the most difficult part, no? Because you know what you want and you know what you have, but how can I go there? So mechanism design is a new study, which was there before Bitcoin, obviously, but not so long ago. It started in the 90s. It's a pretty young field. And at the moment, it's mainly um, focusing on auctions. I will explain one, one example now. But the general idea is to design a mechanism um, which incentivizes rational agents. That's quite important. So you make the assumption that everyone is rational and, um, and that they behave in a certain way. And that they use then their private information, OK? or their private resource, in, in Bitcoin, for example, not everyone has the same mining uh, equipment, okay? This is private. This is based on the miner and how much he wants to uh, invest in his mining. But it leads to a socially desired outcome, okay? And in Bitcoin, for example, it's updating the blockchain. But we have um, a, a really famous application at the moment in our current economy, actually. eBay is using it, Google is using it. And it's a, it's a way of, imagine I have this water, yeah, okay? 
And my goal is I want to give this water to the person here in the room who has the highest utility for this water. OK, so how can I find this out? How can I find out who here in this room needs this water the most? Uh, first of all, I do two assumptions. And the first assumption is that you behave rational. Yeah, that makes everything always really easy. And the second assumption is that the price you're willing to pay is reflecting your utility. OK, I can't now adjust for poor and rich people because uh, that makes it really complex. So what I can do is I can make an auction. No? So you bid, and the person who gives the highest bid will gain this water. What is the problem of this mechanism? Anyone knows? Will the water then go to the person with the highest utility, reflected by the price? Hmm? Why not? Because therefore you would take into account certain factors that are according to the whole system, which is not equal for everyone. Yeah, okay. This is what I said before, that some people have just more possibility to pay more. But I, I mean, I now say your highest utility reflected by your price. If that person can't afford it. Yeah, this is, um, this is a general problem that mm, you can't solve this through this mechanism, that some people have more money than others, let's say. But therefore I said the willingness to pay. Okay, you can, all, you can even say in percentage. Imagine you all have 100 euros, and I say, I want to know who from this 100 euros is willing to give me the most to get this water. So then you have all equal, equal situation, okay? But still, with this auction, I won't get it. And why? We will find out if we put ourselves in the individual actors. So what is my problem? I want this water, okay? And I have also um, a willingness to pay for this water. Let's say 30 euros. I will pay 30 euros. That's my highest amount I can, I can pay. If I now bid with 30 euros, if I, don't gain, if I don't win the auction, OK, I don't win anything, no? But if I'm, if I'm the lucky one and win the auction, I will come up with a zero win. And why? Because I bid with everything I have. So I have the water, but I paid with everything I, ca I have. Therefore, economically, it would be better to bid a little bit less so that I make actually, uh, that I make actually a benefit. But the problem is, this a little bit less, I can't define. Because if I, if I pay a little bit less, the more less I pay, the better for me, right? Because I, I don't have to pay so much. But the less I bid, the less the probability I win. So I'm in this dilemma. Therefore, there is a new rule which uh, changes a little bit the mechanism design, and this is the second highest auction, the second highest price auction. And this works nearly the same way. You know this uh, design? I'm, I'm sorry, there are open auctions. Everybody knows who's, who's opting. Yeah, but you don't know it's private information. You don't know what the others are saying. Right. Yeah. So the second highest price auction model is you bid again, and in the moment you win, you don't have to pay the highest, so your own bid. You have to pay the second highest. So now, what is the best strategy? If I Bit. If I, I, I want to buy, uh, I want to uh, pay 30 euros, I said, right? So if I now bid 30 euros and I win, I have to pay only the second highest. So in any case, I will have a benefit which is higher than zero. Now imagine, as I said, my willingness to pay is 30. I bid with 33 because I want to make my probability higher to win. But imagine the second one bids with 32. Then I have a minus. Then I have two euros I was not willing to pay. So this is not a good strategy. If I pay less than I'm willing to pay, so only 25, for example, the probability of winning will go down. So by this mechanism, the optimum strategy and optimum strategy means in, in mechanism design that it's the best strategy, it doesn't matter what all the others are doing, is to bid with your, with your true value. 
And because everyone has this optimal strategy, me as a designer, I will find out to the highest who has the highest utility without know knowing exactly your private information. So only through the mechanism itself, I could give the water to the person who has the high highest utility. Okay, so this is uh, mechanism design and there you can already see it's quite complex if you want to go deeper into this. Uh, if you're in the economic field, you know it's all about formulas, you have to prove things. It's all proven, okay? It's not just me talking about this. Okay, that's all perfect, so I will, uh, I think it's really late. I will do it now really fast. Um, the problem of all this mechanism design game theory is this, this one, yeah, yeah, I do really fast. The one uh, assumption that we all be behave rational. And the problem is, that's not the case. So often we are not machines, luckily. So uh, economic, uh, behavioral economics is like the brother of game theory, let's say. Game theory is looking at humans from a reasoning perspective. So game theory explains how people will behave by just rational reasoning. Behavioral economics goes on the other, on the other side and says, let's see how humans behave and then try to find an expla explanation why they do this. So the best example is fear. If uh, fear is involved, people start behaving not rational anymore. And um, I, I don't have time, I just want to give you one quick example. This is the ultimatum game, where you can see how people are not behaving rational. This is a, a game where you get 100 euros, yeah, but only under the condition that you have to offer apart from this 100 euros to another person. And if the other person will accept this offer, you will get the rest from the 100 euros. If the other person will decline and will deny, um, reject the offer, you get nothing. So now, if I would offer to you just one cent, you should rationally, you should accept. Because before you had not this cent, now you have a cent. But in reality, we see that under 30 euros, the people don't accept for different reasons. Maybe a little bit of, well, you didn't want to give me more, so now you'd get nothing. So a little bit of guilty and so on. Just quick, um, in the blockchain space, there's a paper around this, and um, how, because how can we include now behavioral economics? It makes it all really complex, no? So um, the author of this uh, paper, I will tell you the name later, he said that the more automatic the, the application is, the less there is um, behavioral economics. So for example, Bitcoin, the mining process, there is no behavioral economics, yeah? It's just finding the hash. And also, the bigger the action space. So if you look at social media, people inter can interact, they can vote, they can publish, so they can do a lot of different things. Then we need to look at behavioral economics. And, well, that's just one sentence. The whole environment of blockchains are networks. We haven't really studied block, uh, networks, so we need to check what are the dynamics here. One you might know is the network effect. We know this from social media. If we find an app we like, the first thing we do is, come, come in this app, because then I, get, I gain more. And this is exactly in the token space, you know, when you, when you talk to people and they have tokens, what do they do normally? They try to convince you that these are so good tokens because then their own value will rise. And, um, well, um, I will just leave you with two uh, uh, sentences about design because in this new world, if you want, you could be a designer, okay? Something what was only um, given to states and, and corporates so far is now in the hand of all the individuals. So people can design now small economies. And if you design these small economies, think about one thing, and this is, if you look at the world right now, which is mostly focusing on competition, the best outcome you can get is an outcome of one single individual which is the winner, okay? But if you actually create an incentive design which is based on, uh, on participation, you could get an outcome which is based on the wisdom of the crowd. And this is the sum of all the individuals. So, like open source, if you know Python and 
and D3. It's, it's the combination of all the knowledge, but there's actually no incentive structure. So now imagine Python and D3 with incentive structure. That, and then we come to Bitcoin and the tokens. And yeah, so I will just leave you with this sentence that incentive structures are really, really important. And if you um, go out of this uh, event or tomorrow, look at the incentives because you will see that there are everywhere incentives. And incentives are actually transforming our society. And therefore, we have now the possibility to change our society and to create something new. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Um, after this nice introduction or course about the fundamentals, um, what I'd like to do is um, try to give, try to take a step back from the fundamentals and and see, I mean, why and how did we get here uh, as a society, and why do we think this might be the way uh, to make the next step in our how do we organize as a society or I, as a world society, we'll see. And then a little bit about um, how do we apply this, right? So how do we actually leverage that knowledge, those fundamentals into what we are doing, uh, which is, can be token design, which can be network effect uh, boosters or whatever, uh, who, or, or even other new, new things that are not existing uh, already. And this is what I'm trying to, to do. Um, Feel free to interrupt, not be, um, uh, not to agree with me, uh, whatever. So, the fundamental questions, and I think Sanha insisted quite a lot on it, is um, what is the game, right? Uh, if you think about work in general, it is a mechanism, right? We are incentivized to work because the way we are organizing our lives within the societies. Uh, we live in, um, pretend everybody to be working, to be active and to actively collaborate or produce for the society, right? But where does that come from and, and has it always been the, the case even before? Right? So we do this because we somehow need a social order. And social order it, it looks a bit as a nasty word, but it's not, it's just that we apparently need structures as human beings uh, to to interact and to live within, we need to like have some I don't know limits or to be able to um, recognize the place we are living in, right? And uh, to achieve this social order, uh, what we need is coordination and cooperation. So, co coordination is um, uh, a way to align the behaviors of many people into one direction to to achieve a goal, for instance, and the cooperation is uh, that we need people to, uh, to work together right, in that same direction so we can achieve what we want to, to achieve. And it, apparently, I mean, it seems to be quite simple, isn't it? I mean, but through history, uh, getting back to the, the 16th century with uh, Hobbes, right, up to Hayek uh, in the 20th century, uh, this way of achieving social order has changed tremendously, right? And uh, so there are many ways to, to obtain this. And you can basically separate uh, those four uh, thinkers uh, into two groups. Uh, the first two, Hobbes and Locke, uh, thought that uh, the, or the social order uh, was to be made. So you cannot uh, rely on humans to do this by themselves. You, you need um, something that goes above ourselves, right? So this can be God, for instance like a divine right theory. And, but this can also be a social contract. So you, you agree as a human to, um, to let go some of your liberty, individual liberty, to, uh, and you sign some sort of social contract that was theoreticized uh, in order to achieve that social order. And uh, Hobbes, for instance, was uh, quite radical because what he was saying is that basically if you uh, leave people do their own thing, what is going to happen is that b because everybody has opposite uh, desires or uh, uh, ideas of how to do things, they will start to be uh, 
there will be enemies, basically, right? And so you will have chaos, and in order to avoid that, you need to rely on, on some uh, central or divine authority. Otherwise, you will go, to, I mean, it's going to be war everywhere, right? Um, so no trust whatsoever in the capability of human beings to uh, self-organize. And then we had Locke in the 17th century, who was uh, from the same group, so it's still a made order, uh, but a little bit more uh, comprehensive, if you will, with, with human beings, right? Saying that the government uh, or the, the central authority um, responsible for the, for the, the rules uh, or the social order achievement um, is more like a, a supportive type of figure, right? It's just there to prevent things to go um, uh, chaotic, right? But still, I mean, there's no, um, the, the social order was not spontaneous. And the spontane spontaneity of social order was um, introduced by the, the second, the, the last two, sorry, uh, thinkers, Smith, to start with in the 19th century, who, as you are, I assume you know this, uh, uh, came with the idea of, uh, of market. And, um, and, but, but there are more things. Uh, the, the idea really is uh, to rely on something like a market or languages or law or money to establish the, the structure uh, with which we're going to achieve the social order. Right? But this can also be civil society. And Hayek, which by the way is an economist uh, that really inspired the, fundamentally, the, or the fundamental thinkers of blockchain. So if you come back to the roots of uh, crypto anarchists and uh, cypherpunks, you will most, most of the time see references to Hayek as the economist um, really close to that, that way of thinking. Why? because he really thought about the um, possibility for a civil society to self-organize and, and to achieve that social order by themselves. And more than that, he was um, ar arguing, and he won the Nobel Prize for it, that um, it's even better to do it that way or, um, with regard to the, the Smith way, which was, um, you know, we, we establish markets and the prices are the incentives, um, that will lead to social order, but we still need an authority to prevent everybody to do crazy things. Uh, Hayek was suggesting the idea that actually it is impossible for a central authority to have all the information that you need in order to make this efficient, in order to make this work. Uh, Hayek uh, thought that, on the contrary, uh, if you leave uh, people behave um, by themselves, the social order will be even better, not only more efficient, but also closer to what everybody wants. Because there's no way for a central planner to have access to the private information that everybody has, which is key, as, as Sanha said in, in her talk, right? So um, this is where we are. So we are talking about spontaneous order. Um, and OK, so to do what? Right, uh, social order, yeah, I want to achieve goals uh, in, in a society, but to do what? And fundamentally, the, the problem here is how do we organize labor? So today we work on projects and stuff, but this is all about labor, so production and consumption. And how do we organize this uh, fundamental task, uh, for now, we'll see if that's still the case in the future, but, uh, of labor within, within society? And the problem is um, to decide you know, what to produce, uh, who, who should produce it, and who will consume it, so the, the demand. And this is really a, a coordination problem in, in the end. And so you can do this uh, several ways. Right? You can do this um, by <coughs> setting up markets where uh, the coordination works by rules, or you can do this uh, with a <coughs> some planning, so a coordination by command. And those are two different structures with different incentives uh, and different consequences to those behaviors that you will see, right? But basically in markets, uh, what works or how it works is with, with prices, which is actually the first decentralized system of information and motivation because it combines both in the same product, right? If you think about it, it's information because it gives you an idea of 
how valuable something is to uh, the people um, acquiring it or, or selling it. But it's also, it also uh, embed a motivation, right? So it can modify the behavior of other people with regard to this product or this service and to act on this information that is also embedded in the same thing. And this is decentralized because every participant in the market, assuming the free market is a thing, uh, but uh, everybody uh, can uh, act on this on a, on a really egocentric, egocentristic way, right? Uh, the other way to do it, which is in planned economy, think about communism and that kind of stuff, uh, where coordination is uh, done by command. So you need somebody or a group of people to manually adjust supply and demand for everything. Uh, the problem with that is uh, obviously that you lack the information uh, or the, the central planner lack information about many things, starting from, as I said, the private information that people have um, uh, and, and will act upon, right? But also, uh, how, how much how, how much do things how much should things uh, be worth in in the economy right so this is this is um, more difficult to achieve if you will than with uh, markets okay so coming back to our thing of blockchain uh, we want to achieve social order we think, or at least through, through history of uh, economic theory, it seems to be the case that um, uh, a line of thought like, like Hayek's um, uh, suggesting that you should leave human beings uh, behaving and evolving into societies with their private information because it's more efficient and we, you will reach a social order that is more uh, beneficial to everyone else separately instead of a vision from a th central authority. But how do you then design interactions between individuals, right? Uh, this actually might not be necessary to do by humans and for humans. So one interesting aspect that is, that is not really uh, maybe uh, spoke about in the blockchain space is this is what this simple protocol of Bitcoin made humans do. I mean, this is huge and there are things like that everywhere now. And if you think about it, uh, by, uh, by the way, it's, it's really similar to wheat, for instance, or um, any other uh, 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 commodity, if you will, like who did what, right? Is it humans that managed to grow wheat to those extremes? Or is it the wheat that made humans uh, to grow it so that it can spread all over the, all over the place, all over the, the planet? And with Bitcoins, the same analogy, if you will, or the same uh, train of thought can be applied. Right? Who is in charge? Who, who is doing what, really? Right? And you can see this if you um, il illustrate or if you're um, draw the, the objective function of the protocol, right? And as Sana already, already said, but here in another uh, format, if you will, the economic incentives for Bitcoin, <coughs> Bitcoin is uh, this one. So the objective really for Bitcoin itself, right? So not if you, you can see this both, you can see this both way. You can see it from the perspective of miners or humans, users that want to use this protocol, but you can also use it or see it, sorry, from the perspective of Bitcoin itself. And in this case, the objective is just to maximize the security of the network. That's the only objective. And to do that, it provides a, uh, an objective function that rewards people who will maximize the security of the network by uh, rewarding them uh, with a, uh, a bunch of, of tokens. And whatever is needed in order to achieve this objective will be done. So uh, econ um, energy consumption, for instance, is a um, consequences of this very simple objective function. Uh, does this have to be the, the, the only option? Right? Can, can we do this differently? Actually, if you uh, know Ralph Merkel for the Merkel tree, uh, there is an interesting uh, article that he wrote as, as a draft, but it uh, hasn't evolved where he argued that Bitcoin is the first example of a new form of life. 
and uh, basically saying that nothing will stop it because it can perpetuate, perpetuate itself, it, it can pay people to work for it, and so on and so forth. Uh, even under some nuclear attack, it's prob probable that Bitcoin will still uh, exist afterwards. So it will never die, basically. But the, the, the second part of it um, argue that you could do this with other form, uh, or you, can, you could create other uh, digital form of life like Bitcoin, but different, right? And maybe we can get to a version of Bitcoin or whatever with another objective function which can be more complex and includes more things or maybe um, decrease some of the negative impacts that Bitcoin has in some in some regards okay but this is where uh, the token economy if you will uh, uh, came so now what what we see um, everywhere with uh, I think it's close to 3,000 different tokens now now is a, um, a very large group of tokens designed pretty much on the same characteristics as, as Bitcoin with a very simple objective function. And some of them are now trying to be a little bit more elaborate. Questions? Uh, I was thinking this way, are you able to explain the difference between the Bitcoin and Ethereum or Litecoin or any other sort of cryptocurrency? <coughs> in, in general or specifically to? Specific, like, uh, I think that Bitcoin has some characteristics that are, that are specific. Yes. Are there any other cryptocurrency could have to but there, there was one thing that was different between Bitcoin and the other ones, as I could read. Oh, yeah. and I would like to understand that more specifically more. Yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. Uh, actually, yeah. You, maybe the equation should say, I think, the objective function of uh, proof of work, right? Because depending on the way you reach consensus, in Bitcoin is proof of work, in Ethereum is proof of work, uh, in Litecoin is proof of work. Uh, also, um, it's always going to work the same way, basically, right? So it's different flavors of how you get there, or you get to consensus, but the, 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 the mechanics, if you will, uh, below it is uh, the same, if I'm not mistaken. But you, you're starting to see new way of achieving consensus through proof of stake, for instance, or delegated proof of stake uh, with uh, EOS. So there are different flavors um, that exist and that have, uh, in fact, different or di distinctive uh, consequences. Proof of stake, for instance, with regard to the energy consumption is, um, is almost zero. So you don't need uh, such amount of energy to do proof of stake, uh, but you do a lot of it uh, to do proof of work. Hmm? So fundamentally, uh, if you look at this under this type of uh, this this angle what you have in the space are um, the blockchains and the different flavors and then you have i think everything else so basically uh, projects icos or you know so all the tokens that lives on top of a blockchain that you can call a dao uh, we have another talk that we might get into some other day about DAOs uh, specifically. But in a blockchain, what you need is to reach consensus. And you do that uh, with cryptography and game theory. In DAO, um, it is different. In, and it is different because you will use reverse game theory or mechanism, um, sorry, reverse game theory plus cryptography uh, for the past uh, in order to design a mechanism to design mechanisms and make your token uh, behave in a certain way. So you, you do basically the, the opposite. In the first place, you design, a, you design a game and you let people play it. That, that's with uh, Bitcoin, uh, with blockchains. But with tokens, you actually have to think about the specific outcome that you want society or a group of people to get to and design the rules of the game in order to get there, which is maybe even more complex, if you will. Or there are um, uh, layers of complexity far more, um, I think, uh, uh, yeah, complex than in the blockchain, although it's complementary. So, so what's a good example of a uh, DAO? Uh, so, so I say that everything is a DAO, basically, because not a lot of projects um, uh, pay much attention to the governance 
but it is basically what they are doing. So they pretend that they will create a token that will be distributed, but in order to avoid the centrality of um, who will be in charge and who will uh, make changes and so on, they, um, they don't speak a lot about it yet, right? But they need some sort of governance to be included. And whether you make it very simple, like, you know, someday we will uh, leave the code, uh, we will make the code public, or we will let the community decide for themselves. Uh, that's the promise that most of projects, I think, are doing right now. Or they go directly for a more elaborated system of governance, where uh, they anticipate how all the decisions are going to be taken in the future, or how, how to get there, right? This is why uh, I would call them uh, DAO in, in general. It's not to refer to the DAO, uh, as you might have implied. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so we are now um, focused on, 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 on that bit, right? What should the rules of the game be? And this is far more complex because you already have to think about what do I want to achieve? And then, as Sana was saying, find the part in the middle, right? I, ha I know what I have uh, to offer, what I can uh, provide to the network, if you will, I and I somehow imagine the future or the outcome. What is in the middle? You had a question? Yes. Uh, no. Just answering that question, I would like, uh, kind of like to go so. so I think that it may sound simple, at the same time mm, quite futuristic, but I think the problem that people have when setting the rules is that everyone may say that your opinion is biased because not every human thinks the same way. Mm -hmm. But what if you looked at it as if you could create some sort of artificial intelligence that is apart from human that could determine the rules of the game. I don't think that anybody could be against that in the sense that artificial intelligence is it's, it's artificial, you're saying. It's not, it's not any way biased. It's totally the most impartial way of finding like the correct form of government. Mm. So, but uh, um, another question I would have for you then is, don't you think that this will be or might be perceived as a, another kind of central authority deciding for you as a human. Are you going to make yours what comes out of a AI algorithm? It depends, I would guess, that that, would, that could be voted democratically as if you want to accept that AI authority of who are not hmm. at the end. Well, I think, I mean, we, we're getting there anyway, right? So AIs or algorithms, I would say in general, are getting into our lives and we don't seem to be um, a whole lot worried about, about it. Um, okay. Um, in a sense that um, things are getting automated uh, quite a lot, right, in, very, in many aspects of uh, our, our, our lives. But I think the key part in how AI will merge into our, our lives or our everyday life is in how transparent those algorithms are going to be. And if algorithms can have or, or should have maybe values um, as assigned or embedded into it, then you can, I think, rely a lot more as a human uh, to in, into believing that what the AI is telling you is actually the best thing for you to do. And I think, because I think this is where the friction is going to be uh, in, this, in this sense. But we'll see. Um, so I won't get into um, mechanism design, but just to um, highlight that it is really about, uh, so what decision should people take given their access to information and a set of choice in a particular situation. And private information and incentives are really the, the key part of, of mechanism design. And, um, and the way to do it uh, can have uh, really dramatic consequences. Uh, for instance, in the Ethereum community, uh, there was a debate at some point about the governance of the proper uh, Ethereum foundation. Uh, some competitors or people were arguing that the um, way the governance is done in Ethereum is um, because it's off-chain, right? 
it involves a human, and uh, it it can be seen as a um, as an authority, right? Uh, if those people would disappear or stop working, the whole thing could collapse. Or even there's uh, why cannot why cannot all the people participate into the into the governance? And I think this can uh, uh, this must be looked at uh, very carefully, because especially for governance, with regard to the mechanism that is being used, uh, can be um, uh, quite tricky. And um, sometimes you actually need some leaders. Sometimes you actually need to rely on people that have at least I don't know uh, a knowledgeable authority or, um, um, that are knowledgeable and uh, an authority in in, the, in their field to to lead the way. Uh, but we'll see. So there are many different um, approach to actually to get to the same uh, objective. But okay, so going forward, so trying to apply all this crypto economics to what we're doing, um, this is really the state of the art in mechanism design for for tokens, and I think in the um, uh, crypto economics, but in in blockchain in applications of blockchain, right, in, in real life, uh, is the state of the art is really uh, that we're trying to make uh, fire with two pieces of wood <coughs> in the sense that um, there is not much equipment, not much tooling at our, our disposal to really uh, prove, as uh, it should be, that what we are designing will actually work. Or at least, you know, to try to do it on a, on a laboratory uh, type of um, uh, level, right? Uh, you, all will, you will always need to <coughs> launch your token, to launch your project, and see how people actually behave in this new uh, network. Um, but you should at least try to make some um, uh, tests and, and prove that what you're doing will, uh, will work. And there are ways to, to get there. And I think uh, crypto economics is uh, leading the way there because of the fundamentals that it uh, uses. And what we're going to see, I think, is a, <coughs> a com not a combination, but you, you will see a lot of engineering coming into the economics and, and vice versa. But the vice versa is already happening with, with blockchain, right? But we still need to improve a lot of the engineering part to make the economic, economic part more uh, robust or to demonstrate more evidently that what we are designing is actually working. And so this is really a, um, a call to the community, and we'd like to be to be part of it at the uh, Economics Hub, but to uh, improve on the design of tokens by ways of scientifically proven approaches. And this means that uh, from mechanism design and all the practical constraints that will be attached to it, uh, we need some optimi optimization design, and from there we could get to uh, token engineering uh, by by the help with, of uh, theories, practices, and, and tools. So there are a bunch of information already uh, published about that, but uh, this is where the community is, uh, is going. And um, finally, uh, a word on the, 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 the token economy uh, with the, the different flavors of token that you can find uh, out there. And I think that the vision that we can we can have now with, with all the tokens uh, available is that we're going for a, instead of a, a single big economy that uh, somehow connects or reflects um, the interests or the um, behaviors of everybody, I think we're getting to a, uh, a set of different interconnected economic networks um, where <coughs> you will have specific tokens or money if you will and specific ways of interacting with the community for different purposes and instead of having you know one wallet with a bunch of different flavors of the same money you will have a wallet with uh, different access to different um, interconnected economic networks to be able to do what you have to do and we'll see. We'll see if this is a, um, a, a better solution than what we have. But this is, I think, <coughs> the way the community at large is, is evolving. And of course, when you try to make sense of, um, 
of the different tokens out there and you know try to classify them and okay so now I know a little bit more about game theory or mechanism design or um, uh, objective functions uh, does this token is uh, really going into all this or is it, or is it just um, the next ICO the first question is obviously do you need a, a, a token for this application uh, most of the time the answer is no um, because the token that is being sold, I don't know if you remember, but at the beginning it was, no, no, uh, what I'm created is a, a utility token. Uh, it's, not, it's not something for, um, for profit, right? It's, a, it's an access to a service kind of token. And we see now that the, uh, the regulators are going down uh, on, those, um, on those projects, um, arguing that this is a security and not a, a utility or however you want to call it. So first thing, try to design projects that are actually make use uh, for what, it, what they are uh, of tokens. Yes? Good question. So you mentioned security tokens. Uh, what about equity tokens specifically? Uh, with regard to the question, do you need a token for that? Mm. Essentially, that's the type of function that they play mm. within a blockchain-based project. Would you say, therefore, that equity tokens should not be deployed in the first place? No, I wouldn't say that. The same way I think security tokens can exist. It's just that many people uh, tried to, or many projects, uh, didn't say they were security tokens by saying that they were utility tokens, where in fact they were security tokens. And the, the, the regulators came for, for them afterwards. But uh, I think to your questions of equity tokens, I mean, it's another flavor, of course. And I think it depends on how do you define e equity. If equity is a, um, a dividend that uh, investors or, or token holders are getting after some period of time, I don't think you need a token for that. You've got everything you need in the normal or traditional economy. Now, you can be more creative with how you define equity. Uh, for instance, you can use uh, inflation to do the same thing. But then you've got uh, other aspects of the the, the networks that the network that you are creating uh, to to deal with. So I would say yes, of course, uh, let's let's do it. But let's see how do we achieve this equity thing um, in terms of the mechanism being used. Um, and then okay, so. If you assume that you need a token, there are uh, three properties that you can think of and that are interest, um, really important to, to achieve this vision of, of interconnected um, economic systems. Because not only do you need a token, which is an instrument which is digital, secure, trustless, and globally accessible, uh, which is pretty much what every product has, right? I have a token, okay, fine. Uh, but then you also need to to make it useful for the people sharing it or using it. And this uh, goes to uh, the second property, which is to have a developing ecosystem that uses it and accepts it. Um, so not only do you need you to provide the service that you're providing, but what you, you're hoping for is that your product or service will be integrated into something bigger than you, right? And because if, if not, then you will add some friction to the whole thing. Um, and less projects uh, nowadays are uh, achieving this uh, second property. And the third property is even um, more difficult, which is to actually correlate uh, your v fundamental value, the, sorry, the value of the, of the token with the fundamentals of the, of the project. So this is really to got the middle part right in the equation of uh, in between the input and the desirable outcome of your project, right? If you can really align uh, the value of the token with the fundamentals of your project, okay? Um, so what we see going, and this is really, you know, it's uh, rough things published a couple of weeks ago or something, um, emerging right now is uh, this notion of crypto economics primitives. And this is also some, somewhere where we'd like to, to, to be or to, to provide some help with. Um, it, it is about um, getting to the point where you can demonstrate that a mechanism applied in a, in a specific um, uh, or for a specific token is actually uh, producing, producing the same outcome all the time. So you've got a primitive 
uh, which is something that exists in other, in other fields. In the crypto economic sense, it's going to be a, okay, so like with auctions, the, the Vickery auctions, uh, it's a mechanism that is uh, proven to be successful in those types of situations. And what we'll see uh, um, emerging in the blockchain space are other primitives with other um, mechanisms that will always produce the same outcomes. And so keep in, in, in mind this when you, when you see them. I think this is another um, indicator of a, uh, a progress being made. And then um, this will also uh, being applied, but also will specialize into different aspects, right? You could maybe, you could maybe and, and this is just a, a food for thought, but you could maybe see uh, crypto economics being applied for applications. So I, I need to design a service uh, for people to use, and therefore I will need some, some mechanism, um, uh, some specific mechanism. Or I need to uh, elaborate a process to facilitate some, some actions. Or I simply need, or I, I just need to update or generate a, par um, a parameter. So for instance, uh, reputation, right? And this is what I do. That will be integrated into a process and then into an application. And we'll likely see like different mechanisms uh, being worked out to do one thing and one thing only, but, but this very, very, very well. And hopefully this is the way the whole token engineering part will start evolving um, towards a, a practice, really, something really new that will finally, after maybe 60 years, um, give uh, right to, to Hayek, who thought that this was actually possible uh, 60, 60 years ago. But maybe today is when we actually have the tools to get to that vision that, that us, that us as, as humans have the capability of, uh, of doing it by ourselves, assuming that we have this, inf um, this um, uh, infrastructure or this surrounding that we can um, uh, get our hands on uh, to, to establish that social order by, by ourselves. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's also about uh, securities. I think, I think most business models will contain really apt value, opposed to those where people get a value or provide a value and get something that uh, can be valued down or track in a certain time. So the way to incentivate uh, gathering things, assets, intellectual assets or whatever, is something that is now absolutely correlated with, with a forbidden uh, model of security tokens. So utility tokens is something that have been used for, for many years, for many business models, uh, where blockchain doesn't really add much, in my view. So how do you see the, 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 the coming future of all those many business models that are based on, on providing that future value of investment, not for purchasing tokens, but for creating value for a coming project? So how do you think that is going to evolve? Do you think that <coughs> regulations are going to be uh, set up in one, two years? And and are going to allow that type of business models. But I think there will, people will find shortcuts to uh, avoid uh, those regulations and uh, find the uh, same type of, of, of model or, or service to the, to the market. Uh, I don't know, with, without tokens actually, without tokenization of, of, of business. Do you want to answer it? Yeah, I want to say something. So the biggest difference is not that there's a token or that there's not a token or that it's a utility token security. The biggest difference of this economy is that you suddenly be part of the product. So there is no employee in Bitcoin. Bit Bitcoin does not have employees. You are part of Bitcoin. So if you are and Bitcoin, is, I only use Bitcoin, not because I'm a fan of Bitcoin, because this is what I assume everyone knows. I could also say Litecoin or whatever. 
but you are actually part of the product. And therefore, you have a totally different incentive to interact. And what I see in the longer term is that we will create network economies. So governments and all the central authorities, how, how I mean, Laurent also explained it with, with the connection to the past. I think we will go uh, now to this new step of evolution in society. I'm not sure if this will be a smooth uh, change or if there will be a kind of a revolution. Because as you, can, as you can imagine, and you said it also, those that are in power, though, those that have the central authority right now, they don't want to give it away. And, um, but they also have a problem, and this is what we see right now, that states, they don't cooperate within each other. So some states do regulations, but then at the same time they have the fear to mess it up, to, to, to not gain this innovation in their own country. And this is actually in favor of this revolution, because the less clear the states are, the more this can, um, uh, can develop by its own. So I think also regulation at the moment are the worst that can happen, because they, the regulations are just also, again, incentives. So if you put, like, for example, in Spain, you have to pay uh, taxes on mining, this is a new incentive. Uh, which is m missing, m m it's, it's messing up the, the mechanism design on its own. Yeah, but I'm going to a more practical um, yeah. thing. What I'm saying is that if you have something mm -hmm. that uh, would be considered a security token today, because y you want to retribute a certain value that someone uh, puts in your platform, yeah? mm -hmm. do you think that you should, you, would you recommend to wait until that, that regulations that would be in place in one or two years? Or would you recommend to circumvent those with that economic logic, like, like the ones you, you are talking about? This is not financial advice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would not recommend... You got to do your own due diligence on that. Yeah. I would not recommend anything uh, in particular, but what I can say after what we've been uh, studying for the past year and a half is that the, the easiest thing to do with tokens, which is to issue a token and then wait for its price to go up, is probably not going to last for a long time. And when I was uh, stating those three properties of, um, of tokens, this is really the first one. A security token is really uh, issuing a token and, and do the best for its price to go up by any mean, right? But once you've got things like stable coins in the, in the space, so the uh, capability of raising funds without worrying about the uh, speculative part of the proper token, uh, then you can uh, pretty much erase the importance or the relevance of that first property because it's a, it's a, it's a, good, it's a, a default thing that you have and focus on the other two. And the other two are much more about what somehow was saying about the community and about the networks that you are generating and how do you align the fundamentals with the value of the token. And if this become, becomes the uh, way of um, evaluating a token, then the fact that it is a security or, ut or, ut or, ut or a utility token or the other way around is not relevant anymore. So I think this is something that is uh, a problem for now but won't be in the long term. Yeah. yeah. So I really don't know what is like being done right now in this world, but I have like a question because when I was looking at the process of the three parts, and I was really surprised by the fact that I feel that it's been very focused on the interaction between the, the different parts of the whole process, because there is no intermediary, and that is like what is bringing the value of, for example, Bitcoin up or down, whatever like people think about it, and. I think that, uh, well, I ask you if you think that it will be in the future more about the parameters in which you set the whole process, what it will drive the value up and not so much the interactions, if, if you think that will happen. Hmm. And by interactions, you mean? I mean, like, not only the mining, but the actual people that buy and sell the, the coins. The trading. Hmm? The trading. The trading, the trading. Yeah. exactly. And the parameters of the 
of, of what you explained before of the, like <coughs> the rules of the game because you said like Bitcoin has all these rules. Oh, okay. The other the others have all these rules, but the one that Bitcoin has that the other don't is this one. So it's basically interesting. Like Something that I think that is true. So um, I mean, Bitcoin is a really interesting case because Bitcoin form is like the oldest cryptocurrency and because it's so old it's not really efficient and has so many problems but it's representing the whole movement so so many people only have bitcoins if you if we really so you, first you have to decide speculation trading and actual change actual cryptocurrency so the speculation will stop it at one or will move to another currency at one point because speculation is just you can speculate with water you can speculate with everything you want but Bitcoin at the moment is the most easiest thing to speculate with. And that's why the speculation is there. But it has nothing to do with the Bitcoin world itself. So I think it will just move to a next cryptocurrency when there is more interest in this value. Bitcoin is also, the dominance of Bitcoin is just going down and down and down. So in two years, I don't think we will have so much speculation only on Bitcoin. We will have it more equal. But then coming back to the actual value, it's interesting because I think Bitcoin will have always a certain kind of value because it's something like the first one and the one that represents the whole idea behind it and so many people have it just because of this but from the mechanism here um, that was German uh, based on the mechanism uh, it's not the most attractive cryptocurrency it has a lot of problems it will it has ASIC mining which is really problematic for the planet and I th I don't, um, so I think people will have Bitcoin like like so many people say like the crypto gold. So you have it, yeah. but you're not using it really. Yeah, that was really my question because that's what really like for example when you think of investing in Bitcoin, it's really something to consider to as a drawback. You see, like everyone wants to buy Bitcoin because it's their go-to, but is it really gonna be the go-to next? Because uh, what is behind it doesn't seem so valuable if you think about it, because there are other cryptocurrencies that might be doing it better in terms of engineering technology, so maybe that's going to be the, the value for the actual, if you take it as a financial asset. Yeah. Well, I, I interject and just say that evaluating it in a dollar value is really just the beginning, because we're relating everything back to how much it's worth in dollars when, if you purchase the other tokens, currently, it's, lo it's largely done in Bitcoin. Yeah. You don't buy it in dollars. It just correlates to a dollar value based on its Bitcoin value. So when you start to see that, and then you also see the fact that uh, there's other digital assets that aren't even tokens, like a crypto kitty that is being exchanged for other things, you know, that's a little bit more uh, out there. But, you know, there was something, you know, Bitcoin's the original. There was, a, you know, the greenback before the US dollar. And, the U.S. dollar was based on gold before it became fiat dollar. So, who knows what's next? Yeah. You know, who knows what? Maybe people predict that Bitcoin could even be the next, you know, international currency. But then again, it comes down to the interaction. Like, where are these coins being used? By who? And then you can compare it to how we have all these different dollars for different countries because we're segregated geographically. There's a lot of there's a lot of variables there. Totally, and I would, I would also add to that uh, that uh, you don't actually need to have one size fits all type of uh, token or, or blockchain even. So you could even, even, even for the same project, but you can specialize your token for one thing and one thing only. Uh, some projects actually have two tokens for serving two different purposes that in combination <coughs> they, think, they think will achieve the, the desirable outcomes that they are looking for. Like I've got one project in mind, which is actually using a token for the liquidity part of the economic network that they are trying to build, like to pay for stuff, uh, products and services, and then they have a specific token that will focus on building the community and improving the network effect of their project. And those are two different tokens that serve different purposes, but in combination will hopefully make the project uh, a success. You had a, yeah, you had a question. Uh, I just wanted to ask you your views 
and what you think on the on the max capital initial comp coin offering, you know, from an economic standpoint. So uh, this was addressed some time ago by by uh, the Ethereum Foundation and the Trinity and these guys. So we see we see it we see a we see a framework today where you cap the, the, the maximum amount that you will uh, allow uh, each each person to to invest or to contribute, right? So or the overall amount of the crowd sale. And this what happens afterwards when we come to an exchange or to a price driven market, which you discussed, it's been manipulated because they add this scarcity um, yeah. component. So what's your view? What what's the best way to go? Cap it and let the market drive it. So from an economic point of view, if you don't do it, you create uh, you create inflation. So you're actually playing with the investment of the people. Oh, if you just print more and more and more, those that already have, mm -hmm. have lower and lower and lower of value from the token they, they gained. Or you reduce it. Uh, or you reduce it later. But I think, and then also, this is not my special, special uh, my, my focus on all this, maybe you know more about this, but as an investor, I would always look on the roadmap. And if they don't make a cap, and also don't have a clear vision what they will do with the additional tokens they gain, it sounds really greedy. And 90% uh, of the ICOs had this in mind. So I would be uh, really suspicious if there is none, and then look at the exact explanation why not, and how this will influence the value of the token holders that, that already have tokens in the pre-sale or whatever. Um, but I mean, the, the general focus on ICOs is also a little bit, uh, in my personal opinion, the best projects, they don't even do an ICO. They just secretly develop and, uh, and the token is, is just gaining value through its uh, professional work. But yeah, that's just my personal view. Yeah, well, uh, again, I, I mean, I don't have a clear opinion on, on this because, again, it, new things are coming up every every day. But um, Gnosis project, do you know it? Gnosis. Gnosis, yes. the prediction market. They had an interesting one, I think, in this regard, because they achieve their goal of selling what they wanted to sell by still having 96% of the tokens in their hand, right? because of the interesting um, reverse Dutch auction mechanism that they used and the people behaving like really randomly <laughs> by, by FOMO, yeah, basically. Yeah. The ICO. They bought at any price when the price was still very high. And so they achieved their goal by selling 4% of the total tokens. So the sale was capped, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. Uh, but they still have 96% of the tokens in their hands. And so they can play very largely with the monetary policy of this specific token. But I'm sure there are other examples where uh, the opposite, uh, so it, it's uncapped, uh, Ethereum is uncapped, for instance, and things are going quite smoothly uh, because maybe the distribution of tokens is more fair. And so what can be done with um, regards to the monet monetary policy is a lot lower than in this case. So I think it's a matter of finding the right way to do it. It's not bad or wrong. Yeah. Um, what, what are some things to look for in, let's say, a cryptocurrency that uh, is, I guess, how do you identify whether or not a cryptocurrency is more crypto-economically robust or sensitive? Hmm. You want to go first? Because, I mean, we've, we've talked about Bitcoin a few times now, and yeah. you've kind of said, ah, it's not so good at these things. Yeah, okay, How so can I identify? Or maybe you can just list a few that maybe are, in your opinion, good at, at identifying these things. I mean, you can now look at factors, what is important, no? So one thing that is important, obviously, is scalability. Because if you have a currency which can't be scaled, you can't mm -hmm. use it broadly. And Bitcoin, based on its nature and what I also explained before, you can't just change the rules. At the moment, it, it uh, updates the blockchain every 10 minutes. So there is a 
is a really slow um, level of uh, scale, uh, scaling. You can't, I mean, Ethereum is doing it every 14 seconds. And, and with the state channels, with radar network, lightning network, you can achieve uh, scalability as fast as the internet. So one is scalability issues, and the other is also, I think the energy waste is something that is a, is a concern uh, in the community, because that's, but I mean, it's also really interesting, that's something I just want to mention, how much we speak about the energy waste in Bitcoin, and how less we speak about the energy waste in the current financial system. <laughs> uh, this is just, I mean, and this is what I really like about the crypto community. It's all really open, and it's the criticism is really, uh, is, is really discussed all the time. Uh, so I'm not so I'm not focusing so much on cryptocurrencies, and I think also because in the end I'm not even sure if they will survive, because if we have one day so many tokens, for what do we still need currencies? So I'm not. I think the mo the biggest issue is scalability there, and uh, what is the impact on the environment, uh, so energy costs. Um. Yeah, well, just to add on, on that, uh, I, I would make a difference between the blockchain layer and then projects. Uh, it's true that uh, com competition will be uh, fierce in this project layer. And I would stick to the three properties that uh, I've read somewhere, and I put a reference to the article, you can, you can look it online, where uh, just to issue a token is not enough. And I think in this... Um, group, you will, you will mostly find, uh, I don't know, <coughs> 80, 90 percent of the project. Um, when you see a project that try to uh, go deeper, one layer deeper into creating an, uh, an ecosystem and how to actually build alliances between or make their project compatible with others, and then how do you actually see their own values or as, um, as founders, as a, as a Yes, as people uh, correlate with the value of the token, this is for me where there is a sign of good use of crypto economics. But it's just a, a feeling right now. We, we, don't, we don't have proof that this is going to be better. <coughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, we were a little bit late, but we were very interested in the topic. I would like to continue to ask a question that the gentleman asked. So uh, the founder of Ethereum VV, so he actually mentioned the scalability, efficiency, and also the uh, and also decentralization. You can only achieve two of them. So if you will need to give up one of them, which one you like to give? You mean decentralization oh. and scalability? And efficiency, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Decentralized systems are really inefficient. So yes. So you have to give up one. You can uh, you. Any consensus you can have all of them, so if you have to give up one of them. So first of all, what, what do you think about this? And second, if you need to give up, which one you, you want to choose? Um, I would ask, what does this world need more? Efficiency or decentralization? <laughs> no, I I mean, if you think about the answer, is already quite obvious, no? I think we live in the highest efficient world we can get at least in the occidental world. Uh, we have an efficiency which is extreme. And now as we, as we jump to machines, efficiency will even increase. But what we have is, I think, also the most centralized world we ever had. So I think at the moment what we need more is decentralization than efficiency. So you think efficiency is, is OK, so give up? Well, give up sounds really extreme, but uh, I think at the moment we have really high level of efficiencies, yes. but we have uh, a really centralized uh, power system in the world right now. Mm, don't, don't you think that the, 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 the way of um, mining does also imply some competition between uh, the mining systems or them, them which will evolve sooner or later? The, the faster you mine, the, the better the machine it is, will evolve sooner or later, because you get more reward for it. Well, well that's already happening, right? Yeah, it's, like a, it's like a race, right? Because yeah. they, so they have the lottery reward with Bitcoin, it's still valid, even though there's guys beating you 
on the on the app on the whole thing. I, I want to know, building on your question, what do you think uh, with your technical knowledge on the subject? How uh, how are some ways that we maintain decentralization while increasing scalability in the token? Well, there are different <coughs> approaches. Um, whether that's on the fun as a fundamental blockchain, uh, so if you've got competition on that layer, and then <coughs> with a specific already existing ecosystem like Bitcoin or Ethereum, there are some evolutions that are being tested, and and we'll see if this with this combined you can get there. So I will I can speak a little bit more for Ethereum because it's what I'm more familiar with, but there are other designs. In Ethereum, what they're trying to do is to um, go both for a division of labor, if you will. In one part, you will have uh, layer two solutions where it's uh, assuming that not all the transactions uh, have to go on, uh, on chain all the time, but you can like bring them together and in, uh, in batches, you will uh, upload them to the blockchain later. So this is scalability without losing decentralization, but using different, a different approach. It's like state channels and so on. And then the other <coughs> um, groups of solutions are um, things like sharding, uh, which is um, how do you, uh, sorry, uh, proof of proof of stake. Uh, sharding is actually in the other, the other like group. And then the other algorithm to reach consensus like proof of stake uh, will uh, will manage to also improve the, the scalability of the ecosystem. So, yeah. So but it's getting more technical. Yeah, I, I cannot give you. It's still a little bit of a mystery to me, I guess, overall, even. For everyone. <laughs> just, just how it. Because um, the whole thing with proof of work is uh, that it maintains the record and it, it really speaks to the immutability of the, of the consensus um, done by this computing. So I, I don't understand at this point um, you know, how proof of stake is a substitute for that, given that. Uh, where's you know is there processing even ha I mean there's processing happening to update these ledgers and the so blockchains but it's, it's not being done by a processor so I mean there is just there is just the problem and the solution right and the problem is how can I find one node which will update the blockchain and with proof of work what you do is a competition and the winner of the competition will gain a reward and. Um, and what you use, I mean, that's quite interesting in proof of work, is you use a resource which is off-chain, which is energy. But you gain something which is on-chain, which is the token itself. And in proof of stake, you have a different way of choosing the person who will have the privilege to update the blockchain. You do it by how much stake you have. So you make a random choose. But the more stake you have, the higher the probability that you are chosen. Okay? And then, once you are chosen, you only do the block and you get rewarded. So what is interesting in proof of stake is the resource to, to get into this game of being chosen to be uh, a validator is the same than the reward. So everything is on-chain. So what you need is tokens, and what you get is tokens. This can be really cool if it works, and it can be de really dangerous if it's not working, because then it will collapse on its own. Bitcoin always have this, or proof of work, always has this connection to the off-chain world, that uh, energy is, is something we can't just produce like this. You know, we have to buy it. So it's, a, it's an experiment. I mean, I mean, most of the people I can understand, I'm in this, we are actually in this space since 2015. So uh, in 2015, this was a really crazy thing. Uh, and when you spoke about Ethereum, people, uh, if you said ITER here in Spain, people thought you'd talk about ITER, you know, because it was more <laughs> famous. Um, but now it seems so common, mainstream, but I think most of the people forget that this is actually changing the world right now. And proof of stake is a global experiment. No one knows if this is going to work. No one. It's really insane. And, and Bitcoin was an experiment on its own. So Bitcoin was not, oh yeah, let's do this and it will work, obviously. It was uh, just okay, there was a mailing list and they sent out this white paper and some people got crazy about it. 
And then it took years and years and years. And 10 years later, we talk about it. It's quite <coughs> interesting. Oh, let's see. Sorry. Can I also ask, what is the main difference between proof of stake and dele delegated proof of stake? Um, well, I'm not the super expert, but uh, proof of stake, so without the delegation, is really random. So the only factor which is uh, defining if you will be the validator or not is how much stake you have. And everyone can join the game. So if you buy tokens, you can join the game. In EOS, for example, I think they have like 13 <coughs> validators. So you have delegated the, the work to some people and only between these people, it's randomized who will validate. Right, you it's assign those tokens to that Yeah, it's, it's, it's more... More it's efficient. More efficient, but more <laughs> sensitive. Uh, and, exactly. and one last thing I wanted to say, too, because I thought about it later, the efficiency. I think, actually, uh, decentralized systems can become far more efficient if they work. Because if you think about if they have a mechanism that works. So if you think about the software world, yeah? So you have closed software, uh, and in the 90s, we all were using closed software. And then programming language like Python started to gain interest. And there was a moment when the closed software was still far more efficient, because there were companies always updating the code and so on. But when, like, I, I really like Python, because you can really see when this language became so huge that the whole global network is using this language, and the whole community is constantly updating. So now it's actually more efficient, and no company can compute with this language anymore. Because they have to put so much money to update the code, whereas the other code is just updated by the community. And we see the same with Bitcoin. I mean, the banks, they try to compete somehow with the R3 and with the consortium, but Bitcoin has reached a level of decentralization, and I don't mean the mining process, but I mean the acceptance, that it's not, it's not possible to store anymore at the moment. There's one thing I agree with you, uh, yes, but uh, I think it all matters how we define what is the decentralization and what is the definition of efficiency. So yeah. also, just for your information, I am a Bitcoin fundamentalist. So you are I, what? I'm a Bitcoin fundamentalist, so I believe whatever Satoshi said is true. Yes. And I, I'm truly <laughs> believing in proof of work. And uh, yeah. for myself, I think proof of stake, uh, the major problem is uh, they have uh, like a uh, attack of uh, at no stake. So that's uh, basically the thing that they can never solve. But DPO, as uh, they, they give a solution, things, uh, I think DPO is too centralized. For example, I'm, I'm, I really want to ask uh, everybody's opinions. For example, if, as long as you've got the tokens and you don't sell it, there's no way to, to, to change it. For mm -hmm. example, if I get like a 30% of the token, I can always vote to it for myself. As long as I don't sell it, there's no way to have a competition. Exactly. That's the, proof of, uh, the problem in proof of stake. Right. It can end up to, to a total centralized uh, world because right. if only four people have tokens and these right. four people will never sell, exactly. then you will, and energy is always there. You can always buy hashing power. Right. So you exactly. can always, that's, that's a problem, but it's quite uh, common they, and they famous. That is the problem. They are how to differentiate uh, EOS and Amazon Web Service. Mm -hmm. They are all centralized. So that's uh, always been the question I have been keep asking for myself. And uh, <coughs> by the, so that's why I think it's very important to have a defi clear definition of so what is a decentralization. Yeah. Yeah. So from my point of view, is a decentralization is a, if uh, this system allow competition, mm -hmm. the game if it is an open one. I guess I guess the question that really excites me is how do you incentivize that competition? You right. know the fact the fact that. Right. The, the whole thing, I mean, off-chain and on-chain resources. I mean, on-chain resources, we're using off-chain resources to affect on-chain right. results. Same same way could go backwards. What if we could incentivize off-chain resources into, sorry, on-chain resources uh, or incentives and values, rewards, and, uh, and get things off-chain with it? That's when, right? That's when you, I guess, sell your Bitcoin back as a primitive example of that. But yeah, yeah. What you say that there's actually pretty inspiring. I, I said I was like, 
you know, if you could outrace off-chain resources, you could re-establish anything. You could do a space race or whatever. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And this is also why you need for that for for making it, uh, to provide an incentive for people to sell their token. You need a something to be bought with those tokens. So. Again, one cool aspect of projects that uh, take um, that see these second properties of building an ecosystem, of uh, building alliances, and making connections with other projects will, I think, facilitate that uh, decentralization with with uh, with new technologies. If we provide that um, liquidity to those tokens. What do you think about it being? Definitely. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago I was in San Francisco. They are actually in the landing the conference. Right? People are talking about this new project. They call it the next generation blockchain. Which <laughs> if someone calls building. himself like this, I would already. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my question. But, uh, but uh, I haven't got time to look at it. But it seems like uh, there have some very cool ideas. Uh, I don't know about that, that project, but uh, I wanted to ask you about. In this might be a little bit of topic, but uh, IOTA and Tango and Oscar, I mean, <laughs> that fits within the blockchain, or this has been a okay, some we say, okay, we enjoy the ride with blockchain, but this has been a time we found something better that really deals better with that dilemma about the scalability, uh, scalability uh, distribution and efficiency because it handles better the real. Well, I mean, the fundamental objective is to reach consensus in a decentralized fashion. Whether you call that blockchain, a tangle, or whatever, it doesn't matter. We are all after the same objective in the end. Um, but <clears throat> it is maybe true that those new projects are, in my opinion, maybe a little bit too close to the others. <laughs> we haven't still figured out uh, or see if those uh, initial designs actually work that we are already building the next thing and the question is whether the difference in terms of capabilities of each one is sufficient sufficiently um, uh, large or, or important to require a new design uh, for those to to provide a, a society with and i'm not so sure about that personally that's just an opinion and um you can't compare public blockchains with private ideas, and Hashgraph is not a public one. So, yeah, I mean, Hashgraph if yes, uh, they, the end the day I haven't looked into it. In Germany, but it's I think it's all nice if they just uh, try to do their <coughs> research and then you decide on your own where you want to participate. Because actually, in the end, it's not about competition; it's about participation. You said before, uh, for you, decentralization is if there is competition. We live in a world with the highest competition, but I don't think our world now is decentralized. I think uh, decentralization is if it's open to participate for everyone. This is, at least, this is my definition of decentralization. And I also believe that total decentralization isn't uh, desirable. I think a hybrid system will be the best. Mm -hmm. ability to have access to exactly to participate in the system Agreed. and if you say for yourself for me scalability is more important than the possibility to participate maybe hashgraph is for you a better solution than ethereum but ethereum is dealing with far more bigger problems to create a public blockchain on a scalable level uh, than than for example hashgraph sorry yeah, it's interesting because it's it's like we have these different models like Tangle and it's being utilized in IOTA, right? So there's a technology there and the essence of that technology is to validate and record the transactions in a unique way. Um, and there's different examples of that. And it's interesting because they're all sort of, <laughs> the, the, the criticism increases of the usage of those technologies with the lack of decentralization because then the validation of what's happened is centralized and the whole system is compromised. So IOTA, for example, and Ripple. Yeah, I, Ripple is sorry, a good example. Sorry any Ripple holders, but um, you know, those are examples of ones that are you know, 
you, I mean, they could just make these tokens. One day the people find out. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like, you, and also, by the way, on, on coinmarketcap.com, you can see with a little asterisk by somewhere, it, it indicates whether it's mineable or not. So if you yourself can't set up a mine or do a proof of stake or something on the coin, I'd be very hesitant to to invest in it, but perhaps the technology that they're utilizing could, you know, might be another avenue or next stage or whatever, right? Like hyperledgers. I don't even understand how it works, but apparently that's, I don't think that's next. So. I mean, it's amazing we can just do that. Uh, I mean, those communities are piling up on those new, new IDs and they can actually uh, fund themselves to do so, which in itself is, is really amazing. So we need a lot of experimentation. And as uh, I said before, I mean, we all after the same objective. So whether that's Bitcoin, Ethereum, IOTA, uh, not the, the centralized ones, but uh, it's fine. We will see. We, we need the best design to come up with the best solution uh, to, to go for. So I have some doubts that I would like you to help me with. So uh, for example, with the whole sense of when you say trustless, it means that you don't have to trust the whole process, the technology, because it's already so good that there is like no need for that. Uh, then again, I, w I was confusing the fact uh, with the question that came on the screen of saying that you can't avoid a token as a possibility, because I think that the token is really an unavoidable and whole part of the formula for this to work because otherwise I, well, I, I wouldn't see it wouldn't be what it is I think and then lastly uh, you have like blockchain and off-chain so if they're opposed why is like the second one being considered like to complement it to substitute it or to help it what and, was the last one? I didn't know uh, with uh, blockchain and off-chain on-chain and off-chain it's just some things exist on chain. But I think that isn't the world we live already like off chain sort of because off chain is not really like what is being looked for with the technology in the sense of uh, not being centralized. So what what is the whole purpose of it? That's kind of like the question that I have. And then again, there you look at like litigators and enforcers that uh, what you were saying before of sort of is it the right moment now? Is it the right moment? later when they start to actually uh, find out laws against the whole uh, system of currency. Because if you think about it, now they, it's all new and they don't really know what to do. But maybe that's the whole point, that they don't really know what to do and they're really gonna be hard in it. Or what if they actually corrupt themselves and go into it? That then, then again, you don't have like that sort, sort of power to actually know what's gonna happen. Okay. <clears throat> Let's answer one, and then we go and have a drink. <laughs> Can you repeat the first one? Yeah, yeah the, the one of the trust list. Ah, this was easy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the rest I didn't understand. So, um, so um, I think uh, you should also not just say, okay, Bitcoin seemed to work, so I trust Bitcoin. I would uh, really encourage everyone to learn these things by, by your own and then decide if you can trust uh, this, this algorithm or not. So just saying, oh, it seemed to work for 10 years, uh, I will trust this now, is again actually the lazy option. And we live already in the lazy option. The lazy option now is uh, I don't want to do my thing, so I just trust someone else to do everything for me. And, uh, and this is actually now the possibility. You, you learn on your own how it works, and then you can just participate in it. So you decide on your own if you trust in cryptography, or if you think this will be hacked one day. So it's your choice of, of, of trusting, but you trust in algorithms and mechanisms, and not, you don't trust in, in companies anymore. You don't trust in, in third parties that can control this trust. I think that what well, you're saying is very clear, like if you actually know what the logarithms are and you're able to understand them, exactly. then really you have it there, like you are the one who's going to make the money. So, but yeah. the problem is really understanding those two. Yeah. Then again, the second question was the sort, the sort of thing of, of a token, when the question of like, if it was like a possibility. Was I think you said this. Yeah. yeah, so that you don't always need a token? Is that what yes, you Yes, because I, well, I remember like seeing one of the... Oh, yeah, that was... 
Do you need a token for that? Yes. And that kind of. Uh, that was yeah. really like. So what? It was like a question because if the whole process is based on is token based, why would you consider the process without the token? Then it wouldn't be that yes. process. It would be what? a new different. One. <coughs> well, the, the question mark was there because maybe it's, it's getting into an end right now, but um, up, up to now, it's like very easy to create a token. And so everybody was creating one without really asking themselves if it was necessary in the first place. And this is why we get into the situations where you have almost 3,000 tokens right now in, in circulation. Most of them are um, utility tokens, where in fact they should be called uh, security tokens. So they're just, you know, a way to represent something into a process and hope for a price of this token to go up. Um, but this, with crypto economics, or at least as we what we envision, is going to be a non-issue because the simple emission of a token won't be enough to um, justify to the investors that you are creating one. Uh, again, if you consider uh, the space with uh, or provided with uh, stable coins, for instance, that are already existing, then you don't really need a token to raise, you don't need your own token to raise funds anymore. And therefore, if you create a token, you will need to convince the community that its utility is somewhere else and not in the raising funds process. See? Yes. So there is no like uh, an organism that is benefiting from it, but it's actually something accessible to everyone that is kind of decentralized, obviously, mm -hmm. and that is also like completely free and public, not not privately owned per se, sort of. Well, it's not incompatible. So there's not a company. Let's continue outside. I think yeah. we have to leave now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for your question.